Okay, let's start again. We'll spend the rest of our time today and then next week on um, Deuteronomy and the Centralization of Worship, Roman 4 on your outline. And capital A is the place of centralization of worship in Wellhausen's reconstruction of Israel's religious development. In other words, what I want to discuss here is what role that concept, centralization of worship, plays in Wellhausen's whole scheme of things. Um, I think that few Bible students realize that the rather innocent-looking phrase in Deuteronomy 12, which occurs a number of times, but in verse 5, 11, 14, and so on, The phrase, the place which the Lord your God shall choose. The place which the Lord your God shall choose. I think few Bible students realize that in that phrase, we are confronted with probably the major problem of modern Old Testament studies. That seems rather amazing, but I think that can be said. That in that One little phrase, the place which the Lord your God shall choose. You're confronted with what is probably the major problem of modern Old Testament studies. The reason for that is that it is this phrase concerning the legitimate place of worship which was the key to Wellhausen's work on Israel's history, which was published in 1878 in that volume known as the Prolegomena to the History of Israel. Um, That phrase is the key to the first part of that book. And the first part of the book provides the, uh, the foundation for everything else in it. That book, Prolegomena to the History of Israel, became the great turning point in Old Testament studies in the last century. And in spite of criticism of certain details of Wellhausen's system since that time, and despite uh, various changes in methodologies of research, that study, Prolegoma to the History of Israel, has retained a dominant position in Old Testament studies right up to the present time. And in Wellhausen's system, Deuteronomy 12 really is the springboard for his whole approach to uh, the history of the religion of ancient Israel. Now, what makes this uh, even more remarkable is that for the most part, The way Wellhausen exegeted Deuteronomy 12 would find the ascent of uh, many Bible-believing exegetes. In other words, there are many evangelicals who would agree with Wellhausen's exegesis of Deuteronomy 12. Um, He read Deuteronomy 12 in the sense that all the offerings of Israel were to be brought to one sanctuary, a central place of worship, And of course that would then be, in uh, the kingdom period, they would be brought to the temple. All the sacrifices. And that any altar outside Jerusalem was per se then illegitimate. There's only one legitimate place for the bringing of sacrifices. And if someone brought a sacrifice somewhere else, it was not legitimate because it was not brought to the place that the Lord had chosen. So according to Deuteronomy 12, in Wellhausen's view, but according to many evangelical interpreters as well, um, Deuteronomy 12 demands centralization of worship. All sacrifices are to be brought to the one 
sanctuary, the central sanctuary of the temple. Yeah. How are you saying? Okay, uh, Ralph Austin says that this is what Peter Ryan is called to say. Mm -hmm. And he gets all to say that this place is Jerusalem. Yeah. And this place is Israel. Yeah. Uh, evangelicals wouldn't say that necessarily. Well, they would say by the time, they would, there are evangelicals who would say that by the time the temple was built, that that became this. Right. In other words, uh, prior to the building of the temple, they could have been offered at other places. But, um, depending on where you were where the ark was and where the tabernacle was, uh, but when it finally was settled at Jerusalem, then that was the only place. Um, and if you're willing to say that, it doesn't mean you're buying into the well house and scheme of things, but as far as the exegesis of that passage, you're saying that it says the same thing that he says. Is there much of them to That's where we're headed to look at that. <laughs> I realize that there's a lot of that. That uh, the, the, well, I think there's a fair amount. Yeah, it's it's not a simple subject; it's rather complex. Um, so that uh, that reading of Deuteronomy 12 would say that the temple possessed exclusive rights. It was forbidden to worship any other place than that one sanctuary. Now, the only point in which Wellhausen then and certain Bible-believing authors or interpreters would differ is that while Bible-believing interpreters would say Moses wrote Deuteronomy 12, Wellhausen says it was written in the time of Josiah. They say it. Both say it's saying the same thing, but the question and the point of difference is, did Moses write it? Was it not written until the time of Josiah? Uh, Wellhausen would say it wasn't written until the time of Josiah, and he says that he was the first one to rid the land of all the high places and to restrict offerings to the one place, the temple in Jerusalem. Josiah was the first one to rid the land of all these other places of, of sacrifice, the high places. No, Wellhausen placed its origin in the time of Josiah. Bible-believing people would say its origin is with Moses. But that what it is saying and requiring is basically the same. So on the Orthodox side, you'd have a date somewhere between 12 and 1400, and with Wellhausen, the date of 621. Now, his reason for dating in 621 was that, in his view, this regulation was impossible to conceive as existing any earlier. He wasn't original in that uh, assumption. He followed the vet, D-E-W-E-T-T-E, who had defended the same viewpoint 70 years before the time of Wellhausen. But the interesting thing is, Devet didn't receive much attention for this idea, whereas Wellhausen picks up Devet's idea and uses it uh, to restructure the whole of the field of Old Testament studies. Um, why the difference? Well, I think it centers in this. Um, there had been a lot of attention prior to Wellhausen's time given to source criticism. There have been a lot of people who have divided the Pentateuch into sources and tried to isolate these sources. Um, but that source criticism really only became uh, tremendously influential when Wellhausen picked up on it and put what was called the P document. He put it late rather than early. And at the same time, he made 621 to be the keystone of his theory. Uh, C, I, J, E, G, and B. A lot of people previously had isolated the same P document, but they had it early. Well, I said, no, P is late, and D is 621. And then when he got these documents, 
put in that sequence, that's what uh, convinced many people that here's a, here's a theory that really explains the way the Old Testament was written and the way the religion of Israel developed. Uh, now, what? why was that? Let me give you an idea of what Wellhausen did, or tried to. It's, it's uh, complex, but let me try to boil it down. His theory was based on the view that when you study the historical sections of the Old Testament, you can see that ideas about the place of worship went through three discernible phases. If you look at the historical material of the Old Testament, you'll see that ideas about the place of worship went through three discernible phases. The first phase, he said, was when the altar was not linked with any specific place. In other words, in the time of the judges and Samuel, you find many altars in use at many different places. And nobody seemed to have any objection to altars located almost anywhere. Wellhausen said in that period of time, early on, there was a close tie between religion and life. Religious observances could be held almost anywhere. He said later there was a desire to give a divine sanction or approval for the places of worship by asserting that their origin was due to the, an appearance of the Lord at that place. In other words, you'd have, a, you'd have an altar, say, at, at Bethel. Uh, well, why do you have an altar, uh, an altar at Bethel? Then you'd get an etiological legend developed to explain why you have an altar at Bethel. Well, God had appeared to Jacob at Bethel. And that is why then there's an altar. At, but you see, the, the, the story comes after the fact, you might say, the reverse of the way we understand things. That there really was an appearance of God to Jacob at Bethel, and therefore there was an altar at Bethel to uh, commemorate that. He'd say it was the reverse. People just worshipped anywhere. Later they developed stories to justify why there were altars at certain places. Um, but in that early period, he said there's no thought of being bound to one place to the exclusion of all others. Multiplicity of altars. And the cult then, he says, is spontaneous and in any occasion in life where there's a desire to uh, give an expression of thanksgiving, you build an altar. And... Uh, you could put that most anywhere. But then a change began to set in. And he said this began with the influence of the early prophets, such as Amos and Hosea. Because these prophets began to uh, criticize this kind of uh, unbridled cult. Question. No. Well, he feels that uh, in the early days of Israel, there's not that much difference, really, between the Canaanite cult and the Israelite cult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, probably, uh, probably Yahweh is, is just a form of heathen worship, you see, it's just another variety. Probably, yeah. I'll come back to that. But under Amos and Hosea, criticism began to rise against this unbridled cult. The prophets promoted their great discovery that true worship was not the offering of blood of bulls and goats, but rather its ethical living. So you see, with the prophets, what Wellhausen said, they weren't so much interested in cultic activity, going to the altar, making sacrifices, performing rituals. They're not interested in that. They're interested in ethics. It's not that they oppose multiplicity of altars as such, but they saw a danger in a religion that placed so much stress on the cult. By cult, I mean outward forms of ritual. Um, because there's a danger in that, because then it's possible that the moral demands of God don't get their due. 
People just go to the altar and perform the ritual and don't pay much attention to the ethical standards, the moral standards. So under the, the preaching of these prophets, the high places, he says, began to lose their significance. The high places being the places where the altars were. And then in connection with that development, you have a political situation in which Jerusalem comes to the foreground, particularly after the fall of Samaria in the northern kingdom, 722. Um, you don't have competition from the northern kingdom with respect to uh, cultic observance. The altars of Bethel and Dan, of course, had been erected by Jeroboam at the time of the division of the kingdom to keep people from going south. But after the fall of the northern kingdom, all that's gone. And uh, Isaiah comes to the south at about that time, maybe 700, and uh, proclaims the supremacy of Jerusalem and the temple, you know, he received a vision in the temple and uh, he gives prominence to Jerusalem. So, all those things together, Wellhausen said, led to a second phase in which Jerusalem's temple assumed the dominant place in worship. Um, Now, he said initially, the people were aware, you can't just abolish the entire cult and uh, centralize it in Jerusalem. That's asking too much. People are too attached to all these local, local altars and so forth. But he says there was an attempt at reformation and concentration. And uh, in that, he feels the priests and the prophets work together. Otherwise, he felt they were deadly enemies. Uh, prophets were against the cult, basically. But uh, he says the priests in Jerusalem would have acquired great material gain from a concentration of worship in the capital, the advantage of the priests, and the prophets were interested in the same thing, not because they were fundamentally opposed to multiplicity of altars, uh, not that, but because their monotheistic concept of God could only really triumph when there was no longer a god of Bethel and a god of Beersheba and a god of uh, these various other sites. Um, I see what he's saying there is early on you did have all these local deities in these local places connected with the altars in the local places. And then the prophets come along, they're interested in ethics and they have this monotheistic concept and a centralized place of worship fits much better, he says, in the prophets view of a central sanctuary than multiplicity of places of worship. So that you get the 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 uh, the uh, coalition of prophets and priests coming together by the time of Josiah, where they attempt to wipe out worship anywhere other than Jerusalem. And to exalt Jerusalem as the only valid place for worship and sacrifice. And he says that's what happened in 621, when that law book was found in the temple. That was that attempt to uh, bring all legitimate worship to Jerusalem, and that's what uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12 is requiring. But he says that attempt was doomed to failure. Because the people were too attached to the old holy places scattered through the land. And uh, as soon as Josiah died, worship returned uh, to, the many, to the many places, the many altars. And he said that Reformation would never really had much of an effect at all if it hadn't been for the exile. They see 6.1. Not that much before the exile, 586. You're only, uh, what, 30 years or so. And the uh, southern kingdom's destroyed, and the Jews are forced into exile. Um, the people are uprooted 
And that not only meant the cessation of the existence of Israel as an independent state in a political sense, but the whole worship system was broken off. The temple was destroyed. And Israel remained in exile for 70 years until Cyrus gave the edict that permitted a return in 539. But you have a whole generation that had never been able to sacrifice um, in Babylon, in the foreign country. Uh, and they had not grown up with the old practices of earlier time. So you, as that generation returns, you have a, a generation of people who really could carry out the earlier reform ideas. And uh, thus you reach the third phase in his... Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, when you have this complete break with the past and the people then come back and no longer think of using the old high places scattered through the land, but they think only of bringing their worship to the central sanctuary of Jerusalem. So, you see, his three phases are, you have the first phase, multiplicity of altars, you gradually move into that second phase and ultimately with 621, besides the Reformation, you have the attempt to centralize worship, which is really a failure. You don't reach that until after the exile when the people return, and then that's uh, almost taken for granted that that's what we'll do. Now, what Wellhausen said was, not only did the history of Israel's religious development move in those three phases, but he found, this, he found the same three phases in the Old Testament legal codes. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. What he said was that the altar law of Exodus 20, 24 to 26, corresponds to the first phase. Exodus 20, 24 to 26, that's in the Book of the Covenant, that's the J.E. code, the early code, says... An altar of earth shalt thou make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen, in all places, plural, where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it, neither shalt thou go up thy steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not exposed thereon. So the altar law of Exodus 20, 24, 26 in Wellhausen's view, corresponded with the first phase of Israel's history, where he had multiplicity of all people. Um, so the law of J and E corresponds to the historical situation represented in that early period. Deuteronomy 12, however, he says, commands the destruction of the heathen places of offering, and commands that the Lord be worshipped in the one place he would designate for worship. And that's where you get to this uh, expression that occurs in verse 5 as well as a number of other places in the chapter where it says, you shall utterly, verse 2 says, you utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you possess serve their gods, Overthrow their altars, so forth. Verse 5, But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and ye shall come. Um, now he connects that statement and that chapter with the second phase of historical development. The time when Josiah promoted his reformation and centralization of worship. So that's the D all killed. And then that leaves only P. So you have the JE code, multiplicity, D, centralization, which really failed at that time. And then that leaves only P. And according to Wellhausen, P is clearly later than D because in D, centralization is commanded, 
and that reflects a situation in which existing contrary practices must be fought, well, he says P no longer stresses this issue. P just considers it so normal that only one place has the right to the place of worship, but according to it, it was never any different since the days of Moses. So he finds the P material from the same background historically as the historical material of the third phase, the return from exile. So the entire P source then he dates from after the time of the exile. So he finds those three phases, and he finds those results uh, in the history and the law confirmed by a lot of other things, and it's take us too far astray to talk about. But notice in that, the one firm date is 621. And he works forward and back from 621. And the whole structure gets its dates from that 621 time of Josiah. The result wreaks havoc on the entire Old Testament. Because if you look at that, you see that what Scripture places under the name of Moses is without exception placed in a much later time. Even the J.E. stuff. The J.E. stuff in the time of Joshua Samuel, uh, Judges Samuel, question. You quoted uh, <clears throat> Exodus 20, uh, 20 to 24. Exodus 20, 24 to 26. 20, 24 to 26. P would be, uh, I, don't have the, I don't have precise references, but it would be large parts of Exodus, almost all of Leviticus. Primarily Leviticus. Almost entirely Leviticus. See, that's where it seems to me that's the gets at the fallacy of what he's doing. He makes them exclusive. And they aren't necessarily exclusive. In other words, you can have centralization of worship. If you go back to the mosaic legislation where it says three times in the year all your males will be appear before me at the, the major festivals. And it seems like that of necessity has to be at a central sanctuary. And the, the tabernacle where the ark was certainly had a supremacy. Uh, but that didn't mean necessarily that there was not legitimate worship elsewhere. I think that's a mistake. Uh, he puts it sequential, so that you move from multiplicity to one. And my impression is he would deny that there was centralization early on. In fact, I'm certain he would. And the more I think about it, because I, I know, for example, if you read the account at the division of the kingdom, where Jeroboam sets up the orders of Bethel and Dan and he states in the narratives of kings there that he did that because other, he didn't want the people going down to Jerusalem. Well, Halton says of that, that has to be historically inaccurate because there was no centralization of worship in the time of Jeroboam. Centralization didn't develop in the time of Josiah and therefore to talk about people going to Jerusalem in the time of uh, Jeroboam is anachronism. So it has to be inaccurate to start because it doesn't fit a scheme. 
you said the, where the place where the ark was in the tabernacle. Remember in Wellhausen's scheme of things, there never was a tabernacle. <laughs> According to Wellhausen, that is material that is constructed on the model of the temple by the late P source projected back into the early period by somebody living in the exile as being where Israel worshipped during what we would say would be the pre-temple time during the time of heaven. He said that never existed. Well, the temple, he doesn't deny the existence of the temple, but what I'm saying is prior to the construction, he wouldn't deny that Solomon built the temple. But what I'm saying is, prior to the time of the construction of the temple, all the material about the tabernacle was a retrojection of a late idea modeled on the temple, but, but then put in pre-temple times, but, but which in fact never existed. And you see, that fits with this scheme of multiple of Walters in time of Samuel, but there was no tabernacle. So anything that talks about the tabernacle there, again, is a historic A fabrication. Yes. The only tabernacle that exists there, the only tabernacle that existed according to uh, Wellhausen in the wilderness is that tent of meeting that's referred to in Exodus 34, is it? Let me see. After the golden calf incident, um, Moses, it says in, in 33.7 Moses took the tabernacle, it says and pitched it outside the camp far off from the camp called it the tabernacle of the congregation oh hell no lady um, and it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of the congregation which was outside the camp now that can be very confusing because at this point the tabernacle hadn't yet been set up. Instruction had been given as to how it was to be built, but it had not been set up. That comes later in the book of Exodus. Um, so that this tent, which is called here uh, a tent of meeting, literally, that was pitched outside the camp by Moses, uh, Wellhausen says that is the only, quote, tabernacle that ever existed. The tabernacle in the sense of the elaborate tabernacle with all the instructions. That's all key stuff that's been projected back over. Of course, he tries to set up a contradiction between 32 7 and the other material. I think all we say about 32 7 is that Moses pitched a tent where God met him and continued that discussion about Israel's apostasy, Moses interceded for the people, and eventually the Lord agreed to continue to go with them after fighting and so forth. Uh, but as a tent where Moses met with the Lord. So this would be J. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. All right, as I said, this this uh, this whole um, three-phase development of history and law just wreaks havoc on the entire Old Testament because what the Scripture places under the name of Moses is without exception placed in a later time. And what in the Scripture serves as the foundation for the rest of the Old Testament, namely the Pentateuch, that's divided into J, E, D, and P, and none of it any longer serves as foundational. What happens in Wellhausen's scheme is, is that Moses becomes the end of development of Old Testament revelation. He stands at the end of the development of Old Testament revelation rather than its beginning. And because he has removed the foundation of Old Testament religion, namely the Pentateuch, 
as being mosaic. And then taking the material from it to construct a new building, you might say, of his own design. He is then left to contrive a foundation according to his own opinion. What is the foundation, you might say, of Old Testament religion? Then? It's not Moses. Well, he's very ready to do that. And what he says is that Israel's religion in the ancient times was no different than Canaanite religion. In the early days, Yahweh was simply a god like all the other gods. He just had a different name. So you see, and here's, here's a crucial point of difference. The starting point of the entire development then is not Mosaic Revelation. It's early Semitic heathenism. Starting point is not Mosaic Revelation. It's early Semitic heathenism. And here's the difference in structure. As we view the Bible, we say that Old Testament revelation runs from Moses to Christ. That's the progression. From Moses to Christ. That's replaced in Wellhausen's scheme by an evolution from heathendom to Moses. See, Moses is the end. But we, you know, we say this is Moses to him. So what for us is the beginning point in the Old Testament is for well out of the end point. We see the Old Testament moving from the law to the prophets and on through. And uh, he's saying he reverses that. You see the, the law and particularly D and T come out of the preaching of the prophets. The prophets are put first. They are the great creators of ethical monotheism. So you move from uh, heathenism to Moses. In the process, the prophets are left hanging in thin air. Because in his view, they're not reformers who stand on the foundation of Moses. That's, I think, the biblical view. Prophets are basically reformers who stand on the foundation of Moses and call people back to their covenant obligation. Uh, according to Wellhausen, they are not reformers. They don't proclaim the old ways. They invent completely new ones. So the prophets, then, are the ones who lead the people by ethical preaching away from early heathenism and bring them to Moses. So that's the, the scheme of things. And that's why this whole issue of the law and the prophets and the order and connections between the law and the prophets is of such significance. I mean, uh, whether you take it in Wellhausen's way or the biblical way. Well, um, that's all under A, the place of centralization of worship in Wellhausen's reconstruction of Israel's religious development. You see the key role that plays. Yeah. 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 Because he would say this is, uh, you know, formulated as if it were placed in the mouth of Moses. In other words, it's. Uh, it's that pious fraud idea. But it's written as if Moses said it, but he didn't say it. So, yeah. Yes? Well, such a conclusion that the goal of what he was trying to do or the result. Well, it's trying to undermine the nation. It's trying to undermine the nation. It's trying to undermine the nation. Probably the latter. I think he was caught up in philosophical. Uh, questions uh, 
both with respect to rationalistic kind of presuppositions and with respect to this evolutionary concept of development of religion, which was in his time was the great new idea of evolutionary development, and sort of in that that kind of framework of thinking. And uh, I think then he was led just one step at a time to come to the conclusion that orthodoxy could not be defended. And uh, you know, this kind of approach is, quote, scientific, and uh, if you're going to keep your integrity, then you have to go wherever that leads you. And uh, that's where it led him. Uh, to his credit, I've mentioned this on the question of history. To his credit, I think I mentioned in this course too, he, he resigned his position on the faculty of uh, theological faculty of Rice Hall, I think was the university he was teaching at, because he, he said in good conscience he realized he could no longer train students for the evangelical ministry. So he resigned his position as a matter of conscience, took another position in uh, Semitic languages at another university. The problem is, many other people, and particularly his, his students and people who shared his ideas, didn't have the same kind of conscience and took positions on theological faculties and promoted these ideas right in the, the theological faculty and captured really the faculties of most major schools in Europe and America. But he got out of trying to train ministers because he realized what he was saying destroyed the message of the Old Testament. He couldn't train people for ministry with his approach to analysis. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, the idea that he had that uh, there was an accomplished centralization after the exile. Yeah. Um, did he deal anything with like uh, uh, the Elephantine uh, situation or with the possible existence? I don't. I don't know that the elephantine material has yet come to light. So I don't think he ever did with that. And as far as this synagogue thing, I think he would. You know, in the time of Christ, you had synagogues certainly scattered. Or he would. Uh, I presume. I'm not sure. I, I don't recall him addressing that. I don't know what he would say about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how can we erase the Old Testament and uh, destroy it and destroy it and destroy it? Didn't he have didactic values? Didactic values? He wasn't really interested in that so much as in trying to recreate, according to his scheme of things, the history of the development of religion in ancient Israel. So it's a it's the perspective he's coming at it from is is the history of religion's perspective. How did Israel's religious ideas develop? But he didn't really address the issue whether it was of value or not. I don't know if he did it in so many words, but in essence, yes. Yeah. What little could be known about, you know, he may have said, there may have been somebody like Moses, but very little of what's in the scripture is historical reliable, historically reliable about him. What we can know about him is next to nothing. And he certainly didn't lead Israel in mass. Out of so, the prophets came before Moses and Elijah. Well, well, yeah. yeah. But don't be thrown by a term. No, prophets come before Moses. I should say Moses before. Prophets come before the material in the Pentateuch that we ascribe to Moses, what we call Moses. See what I'm saying? That, that stuff, the JDP stuff, was not written by Moses. It was written by his late people. Yeah. With the prophets, it depends on which of the prophets. Some of the prophets, like Amos, he wouldn't have great trouble with authenticity of Amos. But uh, some of the others he would. Then, I don't know if you mind the answer, but isn't that a circular, purely a circular position? 
I'd say his premise is the evolutionary development of religion. All religions develop in that kind of a pattern. Therefore, Israel's must have developed in that kind of a pattern. Therefore, you can't have these sophisticated concepts and highly developed ritual systems early on in Israel. It had to be late. So his premise really is that evolutionary development of the religious system. And then he finds a way to rearrange the material in the Old Testament so it's going to fit that kind of a scheme of things. Does he trace monotheism? Or is it the problem with the Well, monotheism comes into it. He feels that monotheism didn't develop, you see, until the time of the prophet. It's Amos and Hosea that begin to develop the monotheistic idea. It's an ethical monotheism. The emphasis is on ethics and accountability to a one God. And so, as that begins to develop, you turn your back on these many deities, the God of Bethel, the God of the Shiva, the you know, these local deities, and the Canaanite deities, even as an out of those Israel was progressing. And that, at the same time, is a factor that points towards the need for a central place of worship, as he felt, because it's much more appropriate if you have one God than one place of worship. <laughs> well, yeah, it's hard to yeah. Everything that we know of Abraham, uh, the all the gods forward is just yeah. you have to, yeah. That's right, that's right, that's right. You have to think in totally different categories from the biblical category. Totally different. And people truly believe that. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, we've got, I see my time's up. Next week we'll have to spend on B, response to Wellhouse and Few. And what, look over chapter 12, because that's where we'll spend a lot of time in Deuteronomy 12 next week. And, uh, yeah, I did ask you to do that. So if you're going to do that, it'd probably be better to do it before next week. The only one verses, what, what was it, 1 to 14 or something? Or 1 to 12? I think it was 1 to 14. Yeah, that's right. 1 to 14. No, not that I know of. about the or, origin of the or, Israelite faith in terms of monotheism being radically distinctive from the pagan culture surrounding the, the polytheistic culture surrounding but I don't recall I didn't read that whole book but I recall I think it was impression he thought it was my impression of Albright is that he he felt I think he came out of an orthodox background he had sympathies for orthodox but he felt here's all this scientifically established Material involved not just by well, but by others. He felt, he felt, you know, it's hard to argue against that, but he always was looking for ways to kind of knock it, and he found a lot of ways to knock it. And so, you know, he said many things that were very helpful for conservatives, because I think his heart was more with the conservatives, his mind was sort of with the well held well, I didn't get the impression from that that he really saw the Israelite faith rooted in the polytheism and so forth. Pagan religion. From Albright. Yeah, from Albright. Seemed that he, in fact, it seemed that he was stressing the difference, the distinctiveness of Israel was its monotheism. Yeah. But, yeah, but then the question is, how early on did that go? Oh, okay. Was that around in the early periods of Israel's history or was it a late development?